Nanda Gandhi, Arun's wife, and she's going to introduce Arun and tell you a little bit about the type of person that he is, type of things he's done. Uh, as you can tell from the pamphlet that's been handed out, Arun and Sunanda run the M.K. Gandhi Institute at the University of Memphis, and they travel all over the country and all over the world, uh, educating, doing workshops, promoting Mahatma Gandhi's visions, ideals, and goals. So without any further talk, introduce Sunanda Gandhi. Good evening. Uh, well, it's quite a big job to introduce him, whom I have known for 43 plus years. Having lived that long together and knowing one, a person that intimately, you don't know what to tell people. It's, uh, then I decided uh, uh, to tell you how we met. Uh, it was, some people find it quite humorous because uh, in those days I was in the final years of my nursing graduation. Mr. Arun Gandhi was visiting from South Africa. He had come with his father's ashes and he happened to get uh, ill with uh, severe appendicitis and got admitted to the same hospital. It was a training hospital and he happened to be in the same ward where I was a senior nurse. And therefore, yours truly had to go and take his vitals and find out all about him. While doing that, uh, we knew because there was a big talk about Gandhi's grandson coming from South Africa. No, not Gandhi's grandson. Mr. Gandhi coming from South Africa and blah, blah, blah. And there was a, a little bit, uh, you know, if you're amongst us young uh, nurses. And then I go to take his vitals. Well, taking his vitals, I find a thick, big volume next to his bedside, Mahatma Gandhi. I looked at him. I was a very, very naughty person. I still am. I'm old, but I'm naughty. Uh, I like to have fun. Uh, looking at the volume and looking at him, I said, young man, I know you're coming from Africa. Gandhi is a very important person to us in India, but you, foreigner, what are you doing with that big, thick volume? Don't try to impress us with that. And very innocently, he looks up at me and he says, wouldn't you be interested to know what people write about your grandfather? And I said, get lost. These are my words. I said, get lost. In India, do you know Gandhi is a very, very common um, family name? And if you t are trying to uh, impress me of all the people, that because you are Gandhi, you are his grandson, I don't believe you. And I just walked out of his room. I did not even try to continue the conversation. Next evening, because the rest of the uh, day I was free, next evening I had to come for the night duty. Next evening I came, and as I was taking over, or, you know, finding out how the patients were doing, and I knew that uh, this young man was operated upon and all that, so I asked the nurse, what is that pretender doing? And she said, what do you mean by pretender? I said, that Gandhi fellow, he was trying to impress me, he's Gandhi's grandson. He says, uh, she, she told me, do you know, the President of India called us three times since morning. The Prime Minister called three or four times. The Chief Minister, that is the Governor, here you would call him the Governor of the state, has visited him twice. And so many dignitaries are walking in and out and we don't know our, our feet are aching because we had to be following them and uh, taking care of the uh, patients as well. And, you know, at that moment, I didn't know what I would do because I had to still go and give him his penicillin shots. That day, I did not know that I was going to spend the rest of my life with this wonderful man. This is a wonderful journey of 43 years. We have had a wonderful life together. We have done everything together. Failures successes, 
but we have really lived it, lived our life to the fullest. We tried to do what our heart told us to do, what our heart felt was right to do. We have two children, they're grown up, we can't call them any more children. They have their children, so we have four grandchildren. I think that's all about it. You, you can read about him in the pamphlet that you get. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and to, for this wonderful introduction, a very unusual introduction. This is the first time I've had this. But this is the first time that I'm here at Harvard, and this is a great honor to, for me. I've been to many universities around the country and around the world, but uh, Harvard has been one of the few places that I've always wanted to come and now today it's become a reality and I'm very glad and happy to be here. I want to speak to you today about the lessons that I learned from my grandfather, um, not so many from my grandmother because she had died uh, much early. The last time I remember meeting her was at the age of six and I have some very faint memories of um, her at that time. But uh, I realized when I grew up that nobody had written anything about grandmother, that everybody had written uh, many books about grandfather. And so Sunanda and I spent uh, several years researching grandmother's life and uh, trying to find uh, all the pieces together and, and uh, write a book on it. And finally, we got the book uh, published a few uh, maybe a year ago, actually, and that was a real hard struggle. We uh, just couldn't get any publisher interested in her story. They all kept saying that nobody is interested in your grandmother. You write about your grandfather and we'll publish it tomorrow. And I said, no, I want to s tell my grandmother's story. And finally, a small publisher in the uh, foothills of the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas agreed to publish it and they uh, brought it out and the book has finally come out and it has been uh, published also in England, in Spain, um, in India now, now that the edition has come out here. But uh, it's a very fascinating story because grandfather himself admits in his autobiography that he learned his first lessons uh, in nonviolence from grandmother. And this happened at the age of 13. Both of them were 13 when they got married. And uh, at the age of 13, grandfather didn't know what the role of a husband should be, how uh, he should behave with his wife and, and uh, uh, you know, what kind of uh, relationship they should have and all that. So he started getting books and pamphlets on this subject and reading about it. And obviously many of these books and pamphlets were written by male chauvinists because they all talked about uh, the husband uh, laying down the rules and enforcing the rules there. And so the first day he came home and he told his wife, he said, from tomorrow you're not going to step out of the house without my permission. And grandmother didn't say anything at all. She didn't react, she didn't retort, she didn't uh, respond to him in any way whatsoever. She just quietly heard him and went to bed. And from the next day, she just continued to do what she always did. She c continued to go out and, uh, and visit and, and go to the temples and the market and everything and never bothered to get his permission. And so a few days later when grandfather realized that uh, she was disobeying his order, he confronted her again and he says, how dare you disobey my order? And that's when grandmother very quietly, without losing her temper, asked him, she said, I was brought up to believe that we must always obey our elders. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. Now, if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your parents, but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother that I'm not going to obey you anymore. 
And of course, grandfather couldn't tell her to do that. And so the whole matter was settled and she got her way. And grandfather says that this was a wonderful way of resolving a major conflict through non-violent means. Now, try to imagine if you were placed in similar situation, what would your reaction be? I mean, it's quite normal for somebody to flare up immediately and just uh, out of anger uh, say all kinds of things which would have only aggravated the conflict and it would have escalated and maybe led to something very serious. But the way she handled it very quietly without losing her temper um, and yet uh, resolving the conflict in her favor was uh, the most important lesson in nonviolent action. Now, I learned this lesson from grandfather because I was a very angry young boy. And the reason for my anger was that I was born in South Africa and I grew up there for, and I lived there for 24 years. But at the age of 10, I was beaten up by some white youths because they thought I was too black. And then a few months later, I was beaten up by some black youths because they thought I was too white. And it filled me with a lot of rage. I wanted eye for an eye justice. I wanted to get back with all these people who humiliated me. And so I began preparations for it. I got so obsessed with this whole idea that I subscribed to Charles Atlas's exercise programs to build muscles so that I couldn't deal with these people. And that's when my parents decided that it was time to go to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and, and learn some things from him. And one of the first lessons that grandfather taught me was about understanding anger and dealing with that anger positively. He told me that it's normal for people to get angry. It's a wonderful thing. Anger is a wonderful thing. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a wonderful emotion. It, it uh, makes it possible for us to do things uh, and, and get things done. But the question is, how do we use that anger? Do we abuse it or do we use it intelligently? Generally, we tend to abuse anger. We just uh, fly off the handle and, and say things or do things to people that changes the course of our lives completely. Today, the prison systems are filled with young people who have acted in that moment of anger, and now they repent it. And many of them have been writing to me and said, if only they could go back and change that moment, they would like to do it immediately. But once something is done, there's nothing you can do to change it. So it's very essential that we learn how to deal with our anger in a positive manner. Grandfather taught me that anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful as electricity is, but only if we use it intelligently. But if we abuse electricity, we can destroy ourselves and destroy everything around us. And yet we bring this powerful energy into our lives because we channel it very intel intelligently and properly. And it's become so much a part of our lives that we can't imagine life without electricity. Today. So in the same way, we must learn to channel anger so that we can use it intelligently rather than abuse it. He suggested that I should write an anger journal. He said, every time you feel anger coming up for whatever reason, don't pour it out on somebody or something, but pour it all out in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem, not with the intention of taking the anger out of your system. Now, a lot of um, psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you today that we've got to get anger out of your system. Find whatever way is convenient to you. Go out and yell at nature or go and punch a pillow or do something, but get that anger out of your system. Don't let it remain inside. And that's useful only to the extent that you get that anger out of your system. But if you have not dealt with that issue that caused the anger, 
then that's going to come back again and again and eventually you're going to be frustrated and you're going to let it off and, and uh, it won't serve the purpose. So grandfather said that the journal should be a textbook of your emotions so that you can learn from it and improve yourself from it and the only way you can do this is by writing that journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding that solution. Now that was a very important lesson because if you look at violence today anywhere in any society much of that violence, I would say as much as 70% of the violence comes from anger. Something motivates us to anger and we just snap and we, uh, we become violent. And yet if we were able to use that energy positively, we would be able to reduce the violence very substantially in our lives. Now after learning this very important lesson from grandfather, and at the age of 13, uh, when I was still a very um, <clears throat> immature and, uh, and uh, uh, feisty young boy, <clears throat> I decided to test grandfather and see whether he had learned the lesson himself. Now this was the period in his life when uh, he was at the height of his popularity and even as he was fighting the British for independence of India, he was concerned about many other social problems that were, uh, uh, that were very uh, important in India at that time, like uh, emancipating the women, emancipating the so-called untouchable people, uh, education of young children, and all of these programs were going on simultaneously, even as he was fighting the British for independence. And all these programs needed funding and uh, he realized that the easiest way for him to raise money for all these uh, programs was by selling his autograph. And so he put a fee of five dollars for each autograph. And every morning and evening when he held his prayer services, hundreds of people would line up for his autograph with their money. And it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And so one day I thought, I said, if everybody could get his autograph, why not me? And I got myself a little autograph book and I slipped it into the pile that I was taking to him, hoping that he would not notice uh, the absence of money there. But he was very shrewd and um, he kept a proper account of all the money that he received. And so when he came to my book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. That if you want an autograph, you will not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't go and ask your parents. And I said, no way. I said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make, make you give me this autograph free. And he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. <laughs> and from that day, every day, when he was in high-level political discussions with important politicians, Indian leaders and British leaders, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he'll sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest, and went on talking politics. <laughs> I don't remember his ever telling me to get out of the room and leave him alone and not bother him when he was doing something important, like we do with our children. When they come into the room while we are working on something important, we shoo them out immediately and say, get out, leave me alone, we'll talk about it later. He never did that, and he never did give me that autograph either. <laughs> I struggled for several weeks for that, but then finally I had to give up and realize that he had certainly taken control of his anger. And I felt that if he could achieve that 
extent of control. We can attempt to reach 50% of it, and that would be a great uh, um, success in itself. There were many, many important lessons that I learned from him. He had a way of teaching, teaching through stories, teaching through examples, things that happened every day of the life. He would convert that into a major lesson. Like one day when I was coming back from school and uh, I had this notebook and a little pencil in my hand and the pencil was about three inches long and you know how um, careless little kids are and so I had this pencil and I looked at it and I felt that I deserved a better pencil. This was too small for me to use. And so without thinking much about it, I just flung that pencil into the bushes because I was so confident that that evening when I asked grandfather for a new pencil, he would give me one. But instead of giving me a new pencil, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and why did it become small and where did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be kidding. I said, you don't expect me to look for this little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do. He has a flashlight. Take this and go out and look for the pencil. And I went out and I think I must have searched for about two or three hours. And when I finally found the pencil and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. Lesson number two is that because in an affluent society we can buy all these things in bulk, and use them indiscriminately, we overconsume the resources of the world, and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty, and that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all the little things that we do every day are acts of violence. Everything that we waste and throw away and, and uh, because we have so much of it, all of this is an act of violence against nature or against other human beings. And we have to be sure that we don't commit this act of violence all the time if we really want to create a world of peace and harmony. He brought this lesson home to me in another way also when he made me draw a family tree of violence, he said the only way you can understand non-violence is by understanding violence first. And he made me draw this family tree on the same principles as a genealogical tree, with violence as the grandparent and passive violence and physical violence as the two offsprings. And every day, before I went to bed, I had to put down on that tree everything that I had experienced or seen or read about or even things that I may have done to other people. All of this had to be analyzed and put in their appropriate places on the tree. Now physical violence is something that we, can, we understand because we see it all the time and it hurts. It's all the physical manifestation of violence, the wars, the killings, the beatings, the murders, rapes, wherever we use physical force against each other. But passive violence is more insidious and more quiet. The type of violence that we sometimes do unconsciously without uh, knowing it. It's like the discrimination, oppression, suppression, economic, political, social, cultural, religious, uh, um, you know, all, all name calling, teasing, everything that we do to one another, which hurts people. And it's that passive violence that generates anger in the victim, and that victim then 
resorts to physical violence to get justice. So actually it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically if we want to put out the fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And the fuel supply is us. We are constantly fueling all the, uh, all the violence that we experience in society. So unless we become the change we wish to see, we will never really have a peaceful world here. And that was a powerful lesson for me. I had to do it for many, many years uh, every day so that I could see the, my own violence, acknowledge my own violence, and then do something about it. Now today most of us live in denial. I'm sure if I were to ask all of you right now whether you were violent or non-violent, you would all swear that you're non-violent. And we are only partly true because we don't go out and beat up people in the streets. But we do practice a lot of passive violence, knowingly and unknowingly. And unless we acknowledge that and do something about it, we'll never really change and we'll never really stop fueling the fire of physical violence. So by drawing this kind of a family tree, it was a way for me to acknowledge my own violence and do something to change that violence into something positive. And that's what his philosophy of nonviolence is all about. How we build relationships between people. Anger was one of the issues that causes a lot of violence in societies. Relationships is another. Uh, today our relationships are based on self-interest and selfishness. We are always thinking about what am I going to gain from the relationship. And if I don't gain anything from it, then I'm not interested in it. And that is a very selfish way of building relationships. And when we have that kind of a relationship, it doesn't last very long. It only lasts as long as we can gain something from it. And the moment we stop gaining anything from it, the relationship is gone broken and it leads to conflict and conflict leads to violence. The grandfather taught us that relationships ideally must be based on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance and appreciation. If we respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation, now that's very important. Because most of us seem to think that we are independent individuals and that we can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. And nobody is independent. We are all interdependent and interlinked and interrelated. Not only as human beings, but human beings and nature. And it's only when we respect that fact that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are here to fulfill a purpose. And we can fulfill that purpose only when we know what our role in creation is. Now we are the most intelligent species on earth, but we are also the most ignorant species. Because we are the only ones who don't know what our role in creation is. So we have never tried to fulfill that role. So we've got to learn what that role is. And when we do that, then we will begin to accept people for who they are and not look on, uh, at the differences that exist there, but just look at the people as human beings. And when we look at people as human beings and treat them as human beings, then we appreciate our own humanity. So this is the principles on which relationships must be built. Grandfather used to tell us, that a society is like a machine. Now you have a machine that is made up of all kinds of parts. There are big parts and small parts and round parts and flat parts and all kinds of parts are assembled together and held together by nuts. And then that machine works efficiently. But the moment we begin to take away parts from that machine, 
and throw them away and say this is too small and too insignificant and we can do without it, then that machine will not function, it breaks down. Because even a small part in the machine plays a very important role and we can't afford to throw it away. So in the same sense, we are all the different parts of a societal machine. And the moment we start discarding people and, and uh, uh, marginalizing them and throwing them away and saying these, these are unimportant and we can do without them, then we are throwing away important parts of the machine of society and therefore our society doesn't function efficiently. Now we are always talking about building a community but we don't know what we mean by a community. A community is not a conglomeration of people who live in the same neighborhood. A community to be a viable community has to be interrelated and interlinked. People have to know each other and have a relationship with each other and have to be concerned about each other which we don't have today. Today we can live in a neighborhood and not know who's living uh, a couple of doors down the road from us. And we wouldn't be bothered about it because it's none of our business. And yet we call that a community. And that's not a community. And that's why our communities today are not viable. We have so many conflicts in the communities. So to have a viable community, it has to be built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. There are many things about nonviolence that we need to learn. We seem to think that nonviolence is a political strategy to be used only in political conflicts. But grandfather said it's much more than that. It's a way of life, it's an attitude that we have to develop. That unless it becomes a part of our nature, it cannot really be a nonviolent way of life or a nonviolent action. We cannot succeed in applying the philosophy of nonviolence in conflict if we don't really mean it and live it and make it a part of our lifestyle. And he did this in his own life and was very successful and he taught many of us to do the same thing. I want to share two more stories with you before I end and uh, invite you to questions. One of them and both these stories by the way deal with personal philosophy of nonviolence. How do we make it personal? How do we make it our day of uh, our way of life? The first story happened in 1940 when I was six years old and we were visiting India and living in Sevagram Ashram in central India and grandfather had created this large community of nonviolent activists there and there was one family there who had a little boy who was about the same age as me and we got on very well together and this boy had a tremendous sweet tooth he just could not resist sweets any kind of sweets he just had to have sweets even if it was plain sugar he, he would take spoons full of sugar and, and eat that and the result was that he started getting rash all over his body and when his parents took him to the doctor, the doctor said, you've got to cut off sweets. No more sweets for this young man until he is cured. And so the parents came home and they would nag him every day and said that the doctor has refused sweets. You are not going to get any sweets. And yet they would have sweets on the table and everybody else was partaking of it. And so this boy didn't obey his parents. When nobody was looking, he would grab some sweets and eat them and the result was that he couldn't be cured so after a few days the mother came to grandfather with the boy and said will you please explain to this boy that he is not to eat sweets we have tried to tell him this but he won't obey us and maybe he will listen to you 
grandfather said, you come back after 15 days and I'll speak to him. And she went away. She didn't know why she had to wait for 15 days. Why couldn't grandfather speak to him now? But she went and she came back after 15 days and grandfather took this boy aside and spoke to him for less than a minute and the boy went home and gave up sweets. Wouldn't touch sweets anymore. And the parents were shocked. They said we were telling him the same thing and he wouldn't listen to us and yet what kind of miracle did you perform that he, you spoke to him for less than a minute and he obeys you. And grandfather said it wasn't a miracle. He said the only thing I told him was that I have given up eating sweets for 15 days and I won't eat sweets until you are allowed to eat sweets, so will you please give it up? And this was the difference there. The parents were not doing what they wanted their son to do. So it's very important that we live what we want our children to learn. We can't use our parental authority and say that you've got to do this because I tell you I'm your mom or I'm your dad and I'm going to tell you to do it and don't question me. That kind of control by fear is a very limited control. And we see this happening all the time in our lives, that we are controlled by fear at every stage. Everybody tries to control us through fear. And so we are always trying to get out of that fear so that we can get out of the control. And it's a battle that goes on uh, perpetually. And we cannot exert fear indefinitely. At some stage that fear is going to break and that person is going to rebel. So control through fear is not the control that we should be seeking. Control through love is a much better way of controlling people. And I learned this very important lesson which is the second story that I want to share with you. A lesson that I learned at the age of 16 from my father. My father was the second of four sons that grandfather had. His name was Manilal and he was the only one of the four sons who had devoted his life totally to um, practicing and professing the philosophy of nonviolence. He lived in South Africa where he, uh, he fought against apartheid and continued the struggle that grandfather had started uh, in South Africa. And he really made nonviolence a part of his life. And this story of mine dates back to when I was 16. We had just come back from India where we had spent uh, 18 months uh, living with grandfather and where I had learned all these very important lessons. We had come back to South Africa and the, the ashram, the Phoenix ashram that grandfather had started in 1903 was 18 miles outside the city of Durban in the midst of sugarcane plantations. Our nearest neighbors were about two miles away from us. And um, when my two sisters and I were growing up there, we didn't have anybody our age to relate to. And so we were um, always very eager to go to town and visit friends and see a movie or something. And one Saturday I got that opportunity when my father had to go to town to attend a conference and he didn't feel like driving that day. And so he asked me if I would drive him into town and I said yes and jumped at the opportunity. And since I was going into town, my mom gave me a list of groceries that she needed. And on the way into town, my father told me that there were many chores that had been pending for a long time, uh, like getting the car serviced and oil changed and all of these things. And since you have the whole day to yourself, please take care of these chores. And I said, okay. And when I dropped him off at the conference venue, he said, at five o'clock in the evening, I will wait for you outside this auditorium. Come here and pick me up and we'll go home together. 
And I said, okay, and I rushed off. And I did all my chores as quickly as possible, and left the car in the garage with instructions to do whatever was necessary, and went straight to the nearest movie theater. And I got so engrossed in a John Wayne double feature that I didn't realize the passage of time. The movie ended at about 5.30. And so I ran from the theater and went to the garage and got the car and rushed to where my father was waiting for me. It was almost six when I reached there. And he was naturally anxious and wondering what happened to me, and so he was pacing up and down. And the first question he asked me is, why are you late? And instead of telling him the truth, I was so ashamed to tell him that I was watching a John Wayne double feature that I lied to him and I said the car wasn't ready, I had to wait for the car, not realizing that he had already called the garage and asked them. When he caught me in the lie, he said, there's something wrong in the way I brought you up that didn't give you the confidence to tell me the truth, that you felt you had to lie to me. And I've got to find out where I went wrong with you, and in order to do that, I'm going to walk home 18 miles. I'm not coming with you in the car. There was absolutely nothing I could do to make him change his mind. He just started walking. It was after six o'clock in the evening, it was getting dark. Much of those 18 miles were through sugarcane plantations, dirt roads, late in the night. And I couldn't leave him and go away. So for five and a half hours, I was crawling behind him, watching my father go through all this pain and agony for a stupid lie that I uttered. And I decided there and then that I was never going to lie again. And I think of that episode very often. It happened almost 50 years ago. But to me, it's still as fresh as though it happened yesterday. And it's the power of nonviolence that keeps it so fresh. Had he punished me the way we punish our children, I don't think I would have learned the lesson that he was trying to teach me. I think I would have shrugged my shoulders and said, oh, I suffered the punishment and gone on doing the same thing over and over again. But this nonviolent action of his was so powerful that it taught me a very important lesson, a lesson that has lasted a lifetime. And that is what nonviolence is about about loving, respecting, understanding, accepting, and appreciating humanity. Thank you. At this time, we're going to open the floor up to questions. We just ask that you speak loudly enough so that everybody can hear you. And please, people standing in the back, there's plenty of seats, so please feel free to come in and sit down. Well, perhaps you are not aware of this, but grandfather was a lawyer himself. He um, was called to the bar at the Inner, uh, inner Temple in London in 1891. And uh, he tried desperately uh, when he came back to India to set up a legal practice in India, but for some reason he just could not um, make a success of it. A couple of times he um, had to refund the fees of his clients because he just could not get up in court and, and defend his client there. Uh, he said he was so tongue-tied and so scared of speaking in public that he just couldn't do it. And um, just when he was uh, thinking that he was an absolute failure, that he would never be a good lawyer and never earn money and support his family, he got this opportunity to go to South Africa 
And mind you, he was invited there as an interpreter, not as a lawyer. Now, there were two Indian merchants who had a legal case against each other, and they had both um, hired white uh, British lawyers um, who didn't speak any of the Indian languages, and so there was very little communication between the client and the lawyers. And so these lawyers were taking them for a ride. The case was going on indefinitely, and, and both the lawyers were making a lot of money out of it. And that's when one of the merchants decided that uh, they've got to get somebody who would be able to uh, interpret and, and do this. And when he heard that grandfather was uh, struggling in India and wanted uh, an opportunity, he invited him over to come there as an interpreter between him and his white lawyer. So that's how grandfather got to South Africa. But in South Africa, amazingly, he made a success of his legal practice. And the reason why he made it a success was he realized, as you realize now, that law is a very violent thing, that we are always uh, creating that kind of a conflict and, and judging, you know, one against the other. And to, able, to be able to win your case, you've got to do all kinds of things to the other person uh, there. And, and so it, it's a very messy kind of thing, and he, di he never did like it. And so he uh, trained himself um, to become an arbitrator. resolved all his uh, cases in his office, uh, at least most of them. There were some cases uh, that dealt with injustice and that had to go to court there, uh, and he went and did that, but uh, to, the, to a very large extent he uh, practiced in his office. Arbitration was his way of dealing with it. Yes, sir. I don't think we can do much by law. I think, uh, you know, it's a free society. People should have the freedom to say and do whatever they want to. If they feel that Gandhi was wrong, let them express it and let the people judge for themselves. I don't think that many of the people in India today really believe all the propaganda that the Hindu fundamentalists uh, are making. And those who do believe, uh, sort of believe out of ignorance. They haven't read uh, Gandhi or never um, studied uh, any of his writings and, and they just, you know, become a victim of propaganda. I would, in fact, suggest to people that they read his writings, learn about him, and judge him for themselves. Uh, I don't think that any law can uh, do this for anybody. Impact on the family? Yeah, but do you mean impact on the family or? Um, yeah, it was a very tremendous impact. In fact, uh, it happened just two months after we left him and and came back to South Africa. We left India in November of 1947 to return to South Africa, and he was assassinated on 30th of January 1948. So it was just two months, and all these uh, uh, 18 months that I spent with him and the memories were still fresh in my mind. And when I heard the news, I was so shocked and so angered that my first reaction, uh, and I expressed this to my parents, was that I wish I was in India, I could throttle the person who did it. 
And my parents immediately reminded me of the lessons that grandfather taught me. And he said, grandfather would never have a, never want you to do that kind of thing. And remember what he said about using anger intelligently and positively. And also about forgiveness. He said, nonviolence is about forgiving people, not about taking revenge. Justice today, unfortunately, has come to mean revenge. We, unless we get eye for an eye, we are not satisfied. And an eye for an eye only makes the whole world blind. So justice should not mean revenge. Justice should mean reformation. And uh, I was able to uh, forgive the person and get on with my life and, and not carry that burden with me, burden of hate. Well, grandfather always believed, in, and one of his famous quotations is that uh, a friendly study of all the scriptures is the sacred duty of every individual. And he made that kind of a friendly study. He studied all the religions, and he took from each one of them whatever he um, felt was important and integrated that into his own life. So his prayer services every morning and evening included hymns from all the major religions of the world. There were Buddhist hymns and Christian hymns and Muslim hymns and uh, Hindu hymns and all of them were sung together by everybody who was present there. In this way he was able to foster a respect for all the different religions of the world in individuals and, and people because he realized that India was made up of so many different religions. And unless we learn to live together with respect and understanding, you know, the same four principles that he talked about relationships between human beings, he said were good for relationships between communities, different religious communities and everybody. So we've got to have that kind of a respect for each other. As long as religion divides people instead of uniting people, we are going to have a lot of conflict. And today we see all over the world religion being a very divisive force. It's dividing people all the time and, uh, and it's become very competitive and therefore uh, it creates a lot of conflict and a lot of violence. So we've got to learn to respect all the different religions and, and uh, you know, live with each other in in peace and harmony. Yes. Well, one thing that he did believe, and he, um, he said this in his writings also, that we cannot create a totally nonviolent world, that that's impossible and that's uh, utopian. Uh, there is some violence necessary in our lives, and, and we can't avoid it altogether. But if we are progressing towards civilization, if we are uh, assuming that every... Uh, step we take in every year in our lives, we are moving upwards towards becoming better civilized human beings, then we should be able to reduce the violence to the bare minimum. But instead what we find today is that the most advanced country, the most civilized country in the world is also the most violent country in the world, and this doesn't fit together. We have to ask ourselves, why are we so violent? And why are we so, um, and yet so consider ourselves to be so advanced? So what we are advanced in is materialism and not in morality. Materialism and morality have an inverse relationship. When one increases, the other decreases. 
when we become so materialistic today and we have advanced so much in material terms, we have denigrated ourselves in, in moral terms. And that's where all the conflict arises. So he said that what we need to do is to find a balance between the two and create uh, a kind of society in which we can all live in peace and harmony. And that means sharing with people and, and helping people. You know, today we have the jungle law. We believe that uh, survival of the fittest. If somebody cannot cope with technology, cannot cope with what's happening in the world today, then too bad for that person, let them fall by the wayside. And we couldn't care less. And that kind of survival by the fittest is jungle law, and we can't have that in a civilized society. In a civilized society, we should be able to help people who are not equipped to do things that we are equipped to do. And I don't mean help in the uh, general sense that we do today. Now, there's a very thin line that divides pity and compassion. We generally today act out of pity when we should be acting out of compassion. And the difference between the two is that when we go out into the streets and see a hungry person, we are motivated to give that person a couple of dollars and say, here, take this money and go and get something to eat. And that is acting out of pity. Because what we are telling that person actually is, take this money and get out of my face. You are an embarrassment and I don't want to see you again. But if we were to act out of compassion, then we would stop to think, why are there so many hungry people in our society? What can we do to help these people so that they can achieve things for themselves rather than be dependent on others for food? And then help them in that way so that we can eventually create them, rebuild their self-respect and self-confidence. And that's very important. Because people who have lived in any kind of oppression, whether it's economic oppression or cultural oppression or political oppression, the first thing that they lose is their self-respect and self-confidence. And what we need to do through our compassion is to help them rebuild that self-respect and self-confidence. So these are things that, uh, you know, lead to a non-violent lifestyle and the things that we need to remember. Yeah, indeed, I think it would work in many, many situations. And uh, I'm sure my wife and I, we have brought up our children uh, in the same nonviolent tradition. And I think we have done a pretty good job. We are very proud of both of our uh, children, our son and daughter. And they are also uh, now doing the same thing with their families. So I, I do believe that uh, things can change. I haven't given the matter deep thought, uh, you know, a, a sort of academic thought to find out what can be done in which situation. You know, something needs to be done in that, in that sphere, but I haven't done it yet. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm.
-hmm. Yes, indeed, that's what we really um, felt the need to do. And so um, we had done this in India for 30 years, where my wife and I worked before we came to the United States. And uh, after we came here, we felt that we should do the same thing here. And so we started the Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, 10 years ago. And um, to raise the money, seed money for that institute, we sold my grandfather's original letters that I inherited from my parents after my mother died in 1988. And these were handwritten letters um, dating from 1895 to the last letter was written a week before his assassination in 1948. They were very um, uh, sentimental. You know, my parents had preserved them for sentimental reasons. We didn't have the money to preserve them properly, and so they had just kept them in a folder. And they were getting yellow and brittle, and uh, we realized that in a few more years, those, pay, uh, those letters would all disintegrate and disappear, and nobody would benefit from it. And so we thought uh, we could sell those letters and raise the money that we need for this institute. We sold them through the uh, Christie's Auction House in London, and we got $56,000 for it. Uh, we were not as lucky as the Kennedys were. And, so we didn't get big money for it, but all that $56,000 were invested in this institute in Memphis. It's on the campus of Christian Brothers University. They've given us hospitality there. Um, we work independently. We have many programs that we do in the school systems, and we go out and do seminars and workshops and lectures in various colleges and universities and schools around the country and now increasingly around the world. We're getting more invitations from outside uh, uh, and uh, so it's becoming a little uh, much for us to cope with but we're hanging on there and doing as much as we can. Yeah, we also train uh, people and I hope that they will be able to can continue uh, working after we are not there. Yes. Well, as a young boy, I was very proud and very, very, um, uh, very, you know, that I was in the center with grandfather, living there at the center of, of all the activities, and, and so many people came and went. Not only came and went, but, you know, uh, every day I would get up in the morning and find a few hundred people sitting outside uh, waiting for a glimpse of him. Uh, and they would be just satisfied to get a glimpse of him and go away, not even talk to him. So it was, uh, I mean, so evident that he was somebody who was very highly regarded and revered, and so I felt very proud of it. And Yes, it did happen gradually, and I don't think that my rage has disappeared uh, in any way. I still get angry, and uh, the only thing is that now I've been able to learn to use that anger positively rather than abuse it. It took me many years to do this, and uh, I, as I said, I drew that family tree of violence, uh, which was in my on a wall in my room, and I did that for many years, and, and I filled up the whole wall with acts of passive violence. And that's when I realized all the different ways in which we are always committing 
uh, violence against uh, people. And I, once I realized that, I began to do something to change that attitude in me. So it is a long, drawn-out process, and I wouldn't say that I'm still perfect. Uh, I'm still learning. Every day is a new learning experience. And I think it's a lifelong process. Well, you know, we tend to look at the population from our perspective and, and we think it's so many mouths to feed. But the poor people look at that as so many hands to work. And so they need more and more uh, people so that they can uh, find security. Since they don't have economic security, they want the security of numbers uh, there. Uh, you know, in a poor family, the mortality rate is higher. so. Their children die um, younger before they reach mature age. They don't have economic security, so if they have some adult children in the old age, the parents can go and live with them. So there are so many other things that go along with the culture of poverty that creates uh, a growing population there. Uh, and, and and unfortunately, the advanced countries of the world has not stopped to think about that and realize that. And so they keep harping on the need to, to control population. But as long as you have poverty on the one hand and a desire to control population on the other, it's never going to gel. Because the only way we can control the growth of population is by first giving the people economic security. And if the advanced countries in the world don't give them that kind of economic security, their population is going to continue to explode. Well, that's where the concept of trusteeship comes in. You know, grandfather's concept of trusteeship, which is a part of the philosophy of nonviolence. He said that each one of us has a talent that we have acquired through our education or inherited. And we think that we own the talent and therefore we exploit that talent for our own personal gains, for our own personal ambitions, whatever they may be. If our ambition is to become millionaires, then we use that talent to become millionaires. Then. Grandfather said that we don't own the talent. We are trustees of the talent. And as trustees of the talent, we should be willing to use that talent for other people as much as we use for ourselves. And it's only when we have that kind of uh, attitude, when we are willing to share things with other people in that compassionate way, then we can help uh, you know, other countries. And now, the United States, for instance, has acquired so much. Today, uh, according to the latest statistics, to maintain this level of affluence in the United States, we use 45% of the world's natural resources, which means that uh, only 8% of the world's population can hope to live at this level of affluence. What happens to the other 92%? What, can, what will they do if they don't have any resources to live with? So what the United States now has to do is their foreign policy should not be based on what is good for the United States, but what is good for the world. And if they can go out and help the world with their technological and other um, advancements to improve the quality of life in, in those countries, uh, then we can avoid the catastrophe. But as long as we don't do that and we think that we can live in our isolation in this 
part of the world and, and don't care about what happens in the rest of the world, we are going to blow up the whole world. And we are not going to be able to live uh, in peace here. I didn't for why do you think it Oh because I think it's a the philosophy is an eternal philosophy and it's applicable all the time in between we have forgotten about it and I think it's time that we revive it and become make it a part of our lives because the way violence is growing all over the world, uh, it's going to destroy the whole world and destroy all of us also. So we need to uh, change the course of the world and make it less violent. Sorry. Well, I'm not against capitalism, as grandfather wasn't against capitalism either. He said capitalism is very good, but what we need is compassionate capitalism, not the type of greedy capitalism that we have today, where we want to grab everything for ourselves and uh, not wa want to share things with other people. That's greediness, and greediness leads to conflict, and conflict leads to violence. I'm not sure I got the first part of your question right. Uh, coexistence of what did you say? Balance between morality and... Well, we've got to realize that life means more than just making money. That it's, uh, we can amass millions of dollars, but at the end of it we'll realize that there's an emptiness that we haven't achieved anything at all because life is not just about making a lot of money. Life is about the quality of life, the quality of relationships that we have with people, our families and others around us and what have we left back for them and, you know, sp the spiritualism and culturalism and all of these things are very important in, in our, in our uh, lives there. But we seem to have forgotten about it. We have become so focused on materialism and gaining material things, buying and buying and possessing, that uh, all the other aspects of life have been forgotten and we need to revive that. Well, through uh, personal awareness, uh, we have to come to our own uh, conclusion how much you need and what kind of lifestyle do you want and uh, what can you achieve within a certain limitations and then how much time you want to spend for the family and for the rest of the community and help the community. So you got to balance all these factors and get in, uh, involved in that.
Well, that's what I felt, that the United States has reached a point when they can now afford to look at uh, what is good for the whole world and not just what is good for the United States. And if they have discovered a cure for AIDS or a remedy for AIDS or any other kind of distress that they see around the world, they should be willing to give that free instead of making uh, more money out of it there, or at least give it to some um, with nominal, uh, you know, uh, charge for it. But um, unfortunately, uh, the foreign policy of the United States and many of the other advanced countries is determined not by the politicians or the bureaucrats, but by the corporations. And the corporations always are looking for how to make a big profit. And if they can see a potential market where they can make a big profit, that's what they, uh, they tell the government to do. And the government is in the grip of these big corporations. And until they break out of that uh, stranglehold and, and start uh, taking compassionate action, uh, we are going to have a lot of problems. Well, that's a good question. The, the oppressed uh, also have some kind of responsibility towards their own people. Um, we find that in, in many of the developing countries, uh, there are also exploiters within the countries, uh, people who um, control the government and, and, and things like that and, and exploit the, the poor people, the ignorant people. It's happening in India and it's happening in all the other developing countries of the world there. And uh, it's only when the people um, decide that they have had enough of this kind of uh, uh, exploitation and want to get out of it and uh, not get out of it in a violent revolution, but get out of it uh, in a, uh, in a uh, non-violent revolution then they will gain world sympathy and, and perhaps uh, the world agencies will see, you know, some way of finding uh, or giving them kind of help. There. But this is such a vicious cycle because uh, much of the aid that comes from the developing countries, uh, which is uh, just given to the, to the governments, uh, and those governments, because they are exploiting, they uh, utilize the aid for their own benefits rather than going to the poor people who need it the most. And it's that kind of a vicious exploitative cycle that we have created, which uh, puts the uh, responsibility both on the giver as well as the taker to do something to change this whole situation. Well, there's no other way that we can get it. I mean, we can't go and steal and grab and, and take things by force, uh, but... Yes, to some extent we can do that, but we still, to keep up with the uh, change situations, we need some kind of expertise, some kind of help. Now today, for instance, Ethiopia has uh, suffered uh, drought for the last uh, four years, and this year again they're uh, in a drought situation, and there's just no way they know how to get, uh, get that kind of, uh, you know, get out of that kind of a situation. And it's there that uh, the advanced countries can help them. Now, it's very unfortunate that, take the example of Somalia. A few years ago, there was a lot of fighting there, and 
and that's when we intervened militarily there to, to bring peace. And once we were able to establish peace there, then we sent the United Nations forces to maintain the peace. And the United Nations forces ended up spending $10 billion to maintain peace in Somalia. But nobody bothered to look at why that situation occurred in Somalia in the first place. And that was the same situation as happening in Ethiopia now. Somalia had gone through a period of continuous drought, and that created a lot of economic distress in the people. And uh, that's when the warlords came in and, and exploited the people and caused all the violence and when we intervened. Now, if the international community had foresight and had seen all these things before they really became a crisis, we could have spent those $10 billion uh, in helping their agricultural e economy uh, and save that country from all that uh, disaster. But you see, individually and collectively, we have become expert crisis managers. We wait until a crisis occurs and then we try to intervene there instead of being conflict managers. If we had the foresight and see that certain situations around the world will eventually lead to a crisis and that we need to do something about it now, then we wouldn't uh, do this. But, you know, we do this all the time, even in our individual lives. We don't look at anything until it hits us in the face and when we can't avoid it anymore, then we want to try to find a quick solution and put a lid over it and, and that quick solution is usually a violent solution. So it is again, yes, our responsibility and, and everybody's responsibility to see that we don't become crisis managers but a conflict manager. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out and sharing in our conversation, and thank you very much, everyone.